Hello, everyone, and welcome to Orthofy's Industry Expert Webinar. Today, we're featuring our net, our industry's insurance expert, Tina Byrne. Um, we have a great program today. For those of you who are joining one of our webinars for the first time, the format for this is typically that um, we just we take this, some of our industry's most trusted experts and bring them on. We spend an hour learning from them. And this year, our primary focus has been to take the courses that we covered in our Nexus business meeting. So OrthoFi conducts a, an annual business meeting called Nexus. And every year, um, you know, we have some of the, the greatest speakers and topics. And so the typical format is that we just bring on someone who spoke at Nexus, and so we're able to deliver that content to the industry um, via webinar for those of you who couldn't attend the meeting earlier this year. Today, however, we're departing just a bit from the normal format. So we're doing two things a little different from our, our normal webinars. First of all, this, this webinar is on a Friday afternoon, as you're seeing, rather than we've been doing them um, on weeknights. Uh, around 8 p.m. Eastern. I'd love to see in the chat from anyone who's here um, what your preference is. Do you do you like this where, where we're doing it on a Friday night afternoon or do you prefer kind of the evening format at 8 Eastern? Um, so love for you to kind of blow up the chat for a minute and let us know what you prefer. Um, so continue to add those. We're kind of keeping track of it on the back end because we are trying to decide the best times for these webinars. Um, the other thing we're doing different is today's topic is not something that we covered at Nexus. Um, you know, at OrthoFi, we do, we work closely with practices insurance networks, and we often get questions about the trade-offs between in-network and out-of-network. You know, do, should I consider being in in-network or out out of network? And so we get lots of questions about that. So we thought it might be a great topic to cover in our industry expert series. And of course, who else uh, would be better to do that than Tina Byrne? Um, throughout the webinar, you may have questions. So put those in the Q&A box, not in the chat. So let's you know continue to add your questions to Q&A. We're gonna collect those throughout the webinar. And then we will leave about 10 minutes toward the end of the webinar to ask Tina those questions and get feedback real time. So this is a live webinar. and. So we love for you to be interactive and, and send us your questions throughout the, the our time together. Um, so let's talk about Tina Byrne for a minute. Tina is well known in our industry as a consultant and, as I've already mentioned, the orthodontic insurance expert. She's also known for her proficiencies in clinical, business, and administrative functions. And she has extensive knowledge and understanding of systems innovations. Um, so this allows her to help doctors and teams with practice efficiency, data analysis, strategic business planning, and then marketing implementation. Um, OrthoFi and our entire industry have benefited so much from Tina's knowledge and also her approach of maximizing in-network allowances for orthodontic offices. Um, obviously, today's topic is another one that is of great interest to this industry, um, evidenced by the large number of attendees who signed up today. We, we have a you know good crowd today. A lot of people signed up for this webinar. So um, really, uh, you know, interesting topic. Personally, I've known and loved Tina for many, many years. She's one of my dearest friends, and we've had the privilege of working together on several projects. Tina, it is great to be with you again, and we're looking forward to your presentation. We would love to see your pretty face. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'm sharing my screen. Awesome. Okay. I, I'm going to let you have it. Thanks, Tina. Okay, thanks, Marla, and thank you, OrthoFi, for having me today. So, yeah, always an interesting topic when it comes to insurance in general, but then when you drill it down to, should I be in network or should I not be in network? And, of course, you know, the question always is, if I'm in network, you know, how does that affect me in terms of my production, my dollars, my discounts, if I'm out of network? Um, how does that affect me in terms of patients coming through the office, patients accepting treatment in our office if we're not in network? So I just like to take the hour and try to focus strictly on that, strictly on what do we think about if we're in network or we're out of network. And I have to tell you that, okay, Marla, my, give me a, there we go. I got it. Okay. 
Um, it's definitely like lots of questions. You know, I get probably one or two calls a week of doctors calling me to say, should I be in network? Should I not be in network? Um, there are a lot of offices on the fence, um, regardless of what their status is right now. Um, and the perception is typically contracting translates into deep discounts for the practice. Um, yep, sure can. Um, but it doesn't always have to. But that's a lot of the perception. Insurance is erratic. That's the other thing I would tell you. It's probably one of the most dynamic aspects in your practice. It's There's nothing static. It's constantly changing, constantly evolving. Um, the change can be anywhere from the subscriber to the plan um, to a new plan. Anyone who's out there listening who, who handles insurance in the office, you know that it happens all the time. And seasonally, we can always expect that we're going to have those times of the year where it's greater um, and creates a big backlog for us. Challenges. Ooh, many, many challenges. Uh, we know how time consuming it is now uh, to spend with insurance. Um, no matter which part of the process you're in, it's time consuming. They don't make it easy for us to work with them, to get information from them, um, to be paid on time. There are so many challenges when it comes to the insurance and insurance benefits. Um, probably not a good way to say it, doctor's clueless. Um, but I will say this, I feel like doctors for the most part have the least knowledge in that area of the practice, they have the least knowledge. Um, it's not something they spend time on as they shouldn't, um, but they they don't understand the big picture of it a lot of times. They don't understand the, the drain on resources, um, just the challenges, again, that we have as team members handling those insurance plans. Um, big, big point I want to make today is that when it comes to your insurance, your decisions need to be data driven. OK, we make decisions everywhere in our office about what we're going to do with marketing, um, our overdue recalls, where we step it up, where we change our processes. You know, what is it that's affecting our bottom line? And we follow those metrics. One thing I can tell you is that there is not a lot of data in offices when it comes to making a decision about your insurance, going in network or being out of network. So let me start by just telling you um, a, a few stories. You know, these are narratives in terms of what I see from office to office. I get those calls once or twice a week, sometimes more. Um, after this webinar, it'll probably be even more. Um, but let me just tell you my thought process as I go through some, you know, answering these questions. Um, not too long ago, I had a new practice owner call me. Um, they were in a rural area of the country. I live in Maryland. They were on the eastern shore of Maryland, beautiful area, um, not very metropolitan. And, um, you know, I'm not really sure what drives patients into his office, but he called me to ask me what plans he should be in network with. And my first question to him is, is your phone ringing? Are patients coming in the door? Are you happy with your new patient numbers? Are you happy with growth? Do you notice being out of network is affecting you in any way? Um, and he said, no, there were no indicators that made me wanna say yes to him. And I didn't, I said to him, I think you're better off status quo and following things that may affect new patients coming into your practice. So when it came to that particular doctor, you know, it was a no. I didn't feel that he should be in network with anything. Um, and, you know, he called me with one thought in mind. We hung up the call and he had a whole nother perspective on it. Another new practice owner um, that this was a very interesting situation that I worked with for a while. Uh, the transition of a, a very senior doctor um, exiting the practice, the newer doctor taking over the practice and the senior doctor, very well established practice in a very affluent area. Um, Delta Dental, like many offices, Delta Dental was the only plan that they seemed to be in network with. Um, but what we found as we worked through some of the questions and where we wanted to position this, the new doctor with network contracting, um, we noticed that over the years, even though this 
senior doctor who exited the practice was a network. He wasn't honoring network fees. So in other words, there were years of patients coming through his practice under Delta Dental. He was charging his fees and they were not being given an in-network discount. Patients weren't aware. They didn't know about it. I mean, they, they didn't ask. There was no history whatsoever that patients were aware that they were not being extended an in-network discount. Um, the transition was smooth. Doctor had good growth. We decided to drop Delta Dental. Now, anyone knows that dropping Delta Dental, if you're a premier provider, you know, there's no going back with that nowadays. But in that particular doctor's case, it was no, you know, let's let's go out of network. Um, and it never affected her from there on. I work with an established practice right now, um, 20 plus years, very large um, practice in a metropolitan area, very competitive area. Um, the large, large local employer, which many times can be government um, in, in metropolitan areas, um, their, their employees have Delta Dental. My client is not in network with Delta Dental. Um, what we know is coming down the pike is that you know, benefits are reduced for a, a subscriber going to an out-of-network provider now. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but we've been watching this very closely as a result of his conversion and what's going on with his conversion. And, and we've really had to step it up because we know if we get a call from a Delta Dental patient and they come in and they've done their due diligence in terms of where they want to have treatment, we know that we're at a disadvantage, okay? There's a reduced benefit. Um, there's not any kind of a discount that goes on if in fact it's relative to the treatment. Um, but the bottom line is that we very clearly are losing patients with that carrier. So we actually looked excuse me, we actually looked at going in network with this particular office. Um, you know, we've we've gotten our fees. We've looked at how we can maximize those fees. Um, but he's certainly at a disadvantage because he may be in a location with six or eight providers and he's the only one out of network Delta Dental. So will that force his hand? Yeah, very possibly it may force his hand. So Unfortunately, I can't say to you that as much as I know insurance, it's good for everybody to be in network because I have as many situations where I would tell a practice, stay out of network or drop some of your plans um, as I would to tell them to go in network. So you have to know your specific information um, when it comes to your practice and what the data tells you. It has to be a data-driven decision. Um, so Let's back up here and talk about assignment of benefit, because whether you are in network or whether you have, are out of network, you have got to take assignment of benefit. I've been consulting for more than 25 years, right around 25 years, and I can tell you on one hand the number of offices that I've worked with in 25 years that took no assignment of benefit. In my days in the office, I can remember a uh, time when assignment of benefit, we had the luxury of not taking it. So let's not get confused, but taking assignment is not contracted, okay? And there's confusion a lot of times. I think doctors are the big ones who are confused by that. If I take assignment, I'm contracting with a network. Nope. If you take assignment, you are basically allowing that patient's benefit to be paid to your office, which reduces their out of out there, they're out of pocket. Um, and the benefits just flow from there. So every office really needs to take assignment of benefit. So here's the double edged sword whether you're in network or whether you're out of network, you've got to take assignment of benefit. So that means you've got to take care of eligibility and the verification of those benefits. Um, we all know what a process that is. Um, you can't get everything you need off of the internet. Um, sometimes the, the information that you get isn't accurate, but it's a very time consuming process. And again, regardless in network or out of network, you've got to do it. There are 
several things now that I make sure offices are aware of when it comes to verifying benefits. You heard Marla say that OrthoFi looks at 40 points in terms of a plan. And there are some very big, big factors in a plan that you have to make sure that you're identifying. Um, we're probably all familiar with how they pay, what their amount is in terms of the dollar, how they pay a percentage and what benefit they use. You may look for work in progress or other things, but here's some things that I've noticed offices getting caught up on that you really have to pay attention to. And one of those is a limit on comprehensive codes. I'm starting to see more and more plans come into the offices where the carrier is basically saying, you can only have one comprehensive code under this plan. And if you're in network, you know that now there are two levels of core codes, the you know, treatment codes, the 8010 through 8040 and the 8070 through 8090. So you have limited and you have comprehensive codes. It's been a strategy for a very long time, and we've been able to submit an 8070 for phase one. Significant if we're in network, because it's got a much higher allowance. More and more plans are finding that to put that stipulation in the, in the plan, in the patient's plan, limits what they pay, limits what we can charge, okay? So, that's something that you have to look for, especially if you're doing a lot of phase one treatment. Um, sometimes you may use the entire benefit, but again, there are large dollar amounts coming through on these benefit plans, and um, it, it's something that you have to factor in. Another one that gets by sometimes is that you have plans that are now saying they will only allow orthodontic treatment one time in a lifetime, okay? Um, so a patient might have a $5,000 benefit, but if they come in and they need phase one and you treat them for phase one, that's their one treatment for the lifetime. I've recently done a study, um, I did a lot of research into carriers and what was standard with carriers. And what I found was this, Almost every carrier out there has said that these stipulations to benefits are plan specific. They're not carrier specific. There are a few, but when it comes to all these little line items that you have to identify, they are by plan. They are by patient. Um, so codes and how many times treatment can happen for a patient are things that you have to understand. They're also putting limits um, on the length of treatment. I'll give you an example. Um, they may say that they'll pay for full treatment for a period of 18 months. If you submit a case and you submit 24 months of treatment, they will prorate that benefit over 24 months, but they will stop payment at 18 months. So again, these are three questions. Do they pay for limit, excuse me, do they pay, um, do they limit the number of comp codes? Do they pay for more than one treatment in a lifetime? And do they limit the length of treatment uh, for a patient in terms of comprehensive treatment? It's usually, I've seen it mostly as comprehensive. You all may have seen it otherwise. And then here's one that um, pay particular attention to in terms of what's coming through especially if you're out of network. Um, they are using what's called a UCR to calculate a patient's benefits. Now you have an allowable fee if you're in network. If you're out of network, many plans now will calculate your out of network benefit against a UCR. So let's look at exactly how that plays out. UCR stands for usual, customary, and reasonable. Um, it's the term and the the metrics that they say they use to determine um, what they'll allow. There's nothing usual, there's nothing customary, and there's nothing reasonable about it. Um, so let's look at a situation where a UCR affects a benefit. So we're an out of network provider, okay? We're not contracted. Our patient presents to us um, with the need for comprehensive treatment. 
my fee is $5,800. They come to the office. The benefit is paid at 50% of the office fee up to $2,500 or so we think. That's the way non-contracted benefits have been calculated forever, okay? Um, UCRs may have been around for a long time, but with higher dollar amount benefits coming into play, um, it's showing up more and more. So in that particular scenario, we're estimating that benefit to be $2,500. And what we do is we pre-credit that benefit. So that patient's out of pocket is reduced and we're expecting 2,500. Now, what happened is we missed the question with, that we're out of network and we missed the question, do you calculate your benefit against a UCR, okay? Um, they won't tell you what it is, but can usually tell you that um, if you have a benefit over $1,500, it's of concern for, for comprehensive treatment. So this carrier actually has a UCR of $3,800 for an 8080 or an 8090 code, a comprehensive care. So now what happens is the patient benefit of $2,500 is now calculated against the carrier's UCR not our fee as we feel it is. We're non-contracted, but what happens is we don't catch it and that benefit will only pay 50% of $3,800, $1,900, okay? So now we've pre-credited in excess, we've actually pre-credited $600 more than the benefit that we're going to get. And when you explain that, it's because we're out of network. There's no easy way of saying certain things to a patient to be out of network. Everything leads to a negative connotation. Um, this is where we get stuck between a rock and a hard place very often when it comes to network. So assignment of benefit, you've got to have that eligibility. You've got to have that verification of benefits. And whether you're in network or whether you're out of network, there are questions to be asked. You can't take they pay at 50 percent up to 1500 there's no age limit there's no waiting period it's a lot deeper than that so let's talk about what else occurs if we take assignment of benefit you have claim submission okay um with claim submission is jumping through all the hoops um and hoopla that they ask for when it comes to claim submission so now you're managing claims as well you're not in network but we've got the workload of eligibility and claim submission. Your benefit receivables. Anyone who's on the other end of this, this webinar right now knows that, again, they don't pay on time. Um, and it's, again, it's so dynamic. It moves around. You have certain carriers that don't pay on time. You have got to understand, regardless, doesn't matter if you're in network or out of network, you're responsible for eligibility and verification, claim submission, and benefit receivables. So there is the bigger process that you've got to have in place in your office um, to be competitive. If you are someone who doesn't take assignment of benefit, benefit hooray for you. Um, but this is usually, um, I, I've never told an office not to take assignment of benefit. In fact, I've worked with some offices where the lack of growth is clearly due to the fact that they don't take assignment of benefit. Um, and their phone doesn't ring. The new patient numbers, the phone doesn't ring. We can track what happens to a patient, whether they accept our treatment when they're in our office, but we don't know how many patients we would have otherwise um, if we took assignment of benefit or ultimately if we were contracted. But I think I've been around, I'm old as dirt, I can tell you assignment of benefit for the most part um, is something that you need to do within your practice. With insurance and assignment of benefit, you have to have operational, com excuse me, competency. And what I mean by that is yes, the system, but you have to realize that your team or your insurance coordinator specifically needs to be educated and needs to be the educator, okay? Um, we know how we have confrontational situations with patients when a benefit doesn't pay as expected and we have to transfer that back to the responsible party. Um, you have to be educated, 
okay? And you have to be the one who's telling your subscribers how it works because they don't know. They come to you looking at a dollar amount, assuming that will reduce their out of pocket. They don't know all the ins and outs that happen with plans nowadays. So assignment of benefit, regardless of what your situation is, this is the workload that we deal with um, because of insurance benefits. And it, it plays a large role in offices. The other thing that is extremely prevalent right now when it comes to insurance is what I refer to as provider steering, okay? And that basically means that carriers are going to steer their subscribers to in-network providers, okay? Um, some interesting statistics here, um, uh, compliments of the National Association of Providers, um, dental providers. And... Um, they determined that 60 to 70% of the population has dental benefits, all right? So we know dental benefits doesn't necessarily translate to ortho benefits because it's a higher level of plan. But the interesting statistic is that 95% of all the dental plans out there are PPO, some type of managed care plan, okay? That's huge. So when you realize that 95% of the patients who may be calling you with an insurance benefit is going to have a PPO plan, they're going to have a situation where they have a choice between in-network or out-of-network. And I have very successful practices that have remained out-of-network, but they have they excel in the other areas. They are the practice of choice, okay? Their results are impeccable. Um, the, the patient experience is impeccable. And patients, that, that's where they go. That's the only place they think about. They have built their success on their brand um, and the patient experience. So if that's you, you, you should think very hard about going out of network. Provider steering, again, the disadvantage of being out of network is the terms and conditions favor the in-network providers. Um, right now, there are numerous plans out there that if a patient comes into your office and they're in-network, they might have a $2,000 benefit. If they're out of network, they have a $1,000 benefit. Significant. That's the, the very specific uh, situation I have with that client that I talked about earlier in terms of a patient comes to his office, he's out of network, um, they get $1,000, but they think they're coming in the door thinking they get $2,000, you know, and we have to explain to them that we're an out of network provider. The other thing is the percentage that they pay. You have plans that will pay 60, 70, 80% of a benefit versus 50% if you're out of network. So, Carriers are doing everything they can to steer subscribers to in-network providers. They're, they're making a benefit. Uh, they're making, excuse me, they're making a better benefit for that subscriber to go to an out-of-network. Um, this is <laughs> um, hard to believe for me, but there are reactive communications that these carriers have. This is a screenshot that I took of someone who posted a situation where one of their patients right after a procedure within their practice got this from their insurance carrier. And it said, did you know network dentists can save you more money? And it reads, we noticed that you or someone on your plan went to a non, excuse me, a non Delta dental dentist. Just a reminder going to a Delta Dental Network dentist usually saves more money than non-network dentist. Interested, find your perfect in-network dentist provider today. So they're proactive, um, the plans are set up, not in your favor, and they're reactive. So this is what we're dealing with, um, looking at not being in-network. Um, it's not an easy path to forge. So these are just some of the things that we look at in terms of provider steering right now. Um, let's talk about data-driven decision-making. And I can tell you that um, I've, I've been managing insurance for a very long time, and I've always looked at certain statistics and metrics when it came to insurance. And over the past five years, I have realized how much more granular 
metrics need to be when it comes to insurance versus in-network versus out-of-network, and not all of them are quantifiable. Um, but 100% of offices that I go in, into usually have no metrics whatsoever in terms of their contracted plans. They're, they're, they don't know. They, they don't know how it affects them. Um, they Very often, they, they, they post their own, excuse me, they post their allowable fees. So there's no discount even shown to that patient, which is the worst thing you can do. You always quote your fee. If you're in network, that first discount is your first benefit of being in network. So um, it's impossible to know even how discounts are affecting offices. And in some offices, a discount is a discount. You know, um, it, it's not labeled as such. Um, I find that if you're in network with more than one plan, you need to have discounts or adjustments to your treatment fees by your contracted carriers. With that, you should be able to not only pull out your discounts, but pull out the percentage of production that you're making from those carriers, okay? And it, it's it's a big picture. You've got to be granular with your statistics with each individual carrier that you're in network with. If if not, you have no you have no good data to tell you where you should be, you know, or where. Should I be exiting? Should I be contracting? You know, how much of a difference is it making? So data-driven decision-making is something that we've got to work harder at when it comes to insurance um, and, and knowing, you know, what, what's it telling us? Where do we need to go? Um, one of the hardest things to do about running a practice is making a decision when you just, you feel like it's a leap of faith. And that's what it is very often right now um, with many of these offices. So cases lost to network providers. Again, you know, treatment coordinators do a lot of tracking. Um, and in, in my offices, we have statuses that we inactivate patients with, okay? A status if a patient refuses our treatment, a status if a patient never got back to us, you know, after we presented, they were pending, we did our follow-up, our due diligence, they, they never cared to like return our call. Unfortunately, that's a lot of situations in offices when it comes to pending follow-up. Um, I actually have a status now in my offices that if we lose a case because a patient chose to go to a network provider and we're out of network, I have a status that tells me that. So again, when you look at the things that, that I've begun tracking in my offices, I can make better decisions for those offices now. We can look at exactly how it's affecting us, what we lose as a result of it. What we don't know is what we're losing because the telephone doesn't ring. So when it comes to being in network or out of network, it is certainly subjective to your practice situation. Um, and you've got to know, you've got to have data. You've got to know either what's going on inside your office or you need to know what's going on outside your office that's affecting things coming in. Um, and again, there needs to be an empirical approach to it. So I'm sure everyone on the other end of this web this webinar right now, you know, should be making notes if they're in network to go back to your office and outline those discounts so that you can be very clear if I'm a MetLife provider, what is it that's coming in my door? What percentage of my insurance is that? What percentage of my insurance discounts are MetLife? And you know, drill it down because it's the only way sometimes you feel confident in making decisions about which path to take with network carriers. You know, the, the whole situation with metrics and insurance, like I say, there's more and more of a need for it. And um, I know that, that OrthoFi totally understands that. There's been so much behind the scenes in terms of this. Um, recently, they just released an analysis that, um, you know, th they work with thousands of offices and they gathered things that were similar in terms of offices, um, in terms of the number of plans they take um, and the similarities with it, and they did an analysis. And I, I found it very interesting, um, a, a couple things with this. And one of them was that the average fee 
for an out of network, if you look at the dark blue, we're in network. And if you look at the light blue, that's an out of network statistic. So the average fee for an in-network office was $492 lower than an out-of-network office. So let me explain to you what that means. That doesn't mean that we're discounting our fees by $492 for an out-of-network. That means that that's kind of the average fee across the board. So that applies to everyone. So if we have 50% of our treatment fees that are insurance-based, contract-based, that's really much higher than that. That's upwards of $1,000, you know, our fees are lower because it's averaging in the fees that are that are not in network as well. Um, the average benefit that's paid for an in-network versus out-of-network, the patient on an average has a $200 benefit that's higher than if they accept treatment in our office and we're out of network. And again, it goes back to that provider steering in terms of what carriers are doing and what a patient perceives, um, you know, that they're going to get in your office versus another office. Now, here's the things that are very interesting um, that that you have to take into account. And I'm so eager to continue looking at these things with OrthoFi, with their statistics and my statistics and what I find. But the average TRC, okay, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of patients accepting our treatment conversion, um, less than 1%, less than a half a percent. So in other words, whether that case was in network or out of network, being in network was really not much higher. And the average new patients in terms of that kept appointments that didn't deviate from our office because we were out of network, the same statistics. So I found this to be extremely interesting. Um, and it's the kind of data that we need to know. You know, for the longest time, um, there, there wasn't a lot of insurance education in general in our industry. Um, and, you know, we're starting to see the need for that. Um, the, the next level, I think, of being confident with, with insurance and advising patients or advising practices, I should say, with insurance is the fact that we've, we've got data, data-driven information. We can make informed decisions. Um, makes me feel more confident when it comes to it. And you can only do that, you know, with larger numbers. I can't take one practice and say that, hey, that, that that's the way it's going to be. Um, it, it's a combination of a lot of things, you know, the type of carriers that you're in network with. So let's talk about the leap of faith. The question at hand here, you know, what's the trade-off to being in network versus being out of network? So let's talk first about if your leap is to exit, okay? You're, you're in an exiting direction. You basically want to end your contracts. Um, first of all, I would say to this, say this, it's a process. And you've got to realize that when you end it, um, some providers, in fact, some of the larger providers will redirect payment, redirect payment to the subscriber. So those ledgers that you had broken out, you have to realize that now that payment is no longer going to come to you. So it has to be a strategy. You have got to plan on how it is you're going to exit those, those plans and not, um, not necessarily make a knee jerk reaction to it. I know that there's so much chatter in terms of how difficult insurance is. And I see a lot of chatter on social media about, you know, insurance coordinators or offices, you know, who just, they just want to exit everything when it comes to it. You've got to have a data driven decision about it. Um, the other thing that I would say to these kind of to these particular offices is have you maximized your allowances? And basically that means that you're submitting more than one code. You know, treatment is what I call now a procedural journey. OK, um, we're doing multiple procedures within the course of treatment. We've just never taken advantage of the fact that we can itemize those when we break down our allowances and it gives us more. Um, and, and discounts less. So another thing is your electives and your upcharges. Um, one other thing I see in offices is multiple discounts. You've, you can't 
take a PPO discount and then give a family discount on top of it. You've got to have single discounts for treatment and you've got to take the larger of the two. And I've never had an office where they had that in place that has had problems with that. So if your leap of faith is to exit the networks, have a plan, think it through, look at where you should go first. Okay. Um, look at maybe I'm not making the most of it, but you have to understand that inevitably with everything that's going on with being out of network, not being in your favor, you've got to look at how it's going to affect you. Um, that leap that we take um, with other aspects of our practice with marketing, you know, there's never a guarantee for marketing unless you're putting out an offer, a coupon, um, and it comes back to you and you're able to track it. You know, um, I know that this patient came through my door with that coupon, but that's going to be an inflated <laughs> statistic anyway, because that patient may have come through your door without that coupon. So it's just not hindsight is not 2020 with marketing and you have to think of insurance the same way. It's not going to be 2020 hindsight. You know, it's it's a leap of faith. And I'm a bottom line person. I look at my growth, patients coming in the door, patients I'm losing, and that's how I make my decisions. Let's talk about if your leap of faith is to contract, okay? Can I make a data-driven decision to contract, okay? Um, it, it, it may be the fact that you have lack of growth. Like I said, assignment of benefit, if you're not taking assignment of benefit, you got to move there first, okay? You've got to see what kind of growth that brings to your office. Um, then you have to look at the external factors, employers, large employers, okay? Um, these large government employers um, who have certain plans, if, if you're within a demographic area where that happens, you know, you're almost forced to, to be in network with those plans. Um, your competitors, again, my story about the situation with one of my offices where we're, we know we're losing Delta Dental and it's because of the large employer. So we've got the employer and the competitor, you know, um, that we've got to talk about. Um, one other thing that I'd say, if you're looking to contract, if you lack expertise, you have to look for it. You have to go seek expertise in terms of taking yourself in network. And what I mean by that is you have to work with someone who's able to guide you to the best plans, who's able to guide you to the best way to participate with those plans, because it's not black and white. There are so many networks and so many affiliations out there. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, Cigna, Cigna is the dreaded carrier now in our industry. I mean, just difficult. Um, and, um, you know, you don't get payment on time. Um, it, it's like, quote, pulling teeth. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> you don't have to go in network with Cigna and get Cigna's fees and jumping through all the hoops. You can go in network with a plan like Cigna through another carrier or another third party administrator. And very often they're better fees. They're less discounted. They're better fees. OK, um, there are plans out there that will negotiate fees. So when you contract, you have the leverage to can we talk about what you allow? Um, it's not enough for us. Can we go back and forth? The network and the web of insurance carriers and plans now is so complicated and such a tangled web that uh, if you don't have that expertise, you have to look for it. Um, you have to work with someone who has the ability to help you negotiate, to help you make decisions about where you're going to go in network um, and how you're going to go in network. So, again, these are two things. Which side of the fence are you on? You know, which leap of faith, faith do you need to make? Um, the What I want you to know, again, is to surmise that regardless, um, Assignment of benefit is not an option. Okay, you, you've you've got to take assignment. You've got to have a fine tuned process for that, um, and it has to be intricate in terms of your growth. Okay, you you definitely don't want to 
find yourself writing off benefits because you don't have a good a good process. You're not collecting them on time. And I see that a lot in offices. That's a lot of cleanup sometimes when I go into an office for the very first time. Their insurance receivables. How can you take a, a balance on a benefit back to a patient that hasn't been in your office for two years? Okay. And you've dismissed them. It's 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 not a good way of doing business. Um, the other thing is that regardless of where you stand, whether you're contracted or non-contracted, you have to reassess, okay? Because external factors are changing around you, employers, plans, um, competitors, everything. So um, you've got Regardless of your situation now, don't think it's a one and done decision. It's going to come back to you, you know, over and over again. And and I'm the bottom line. Hey, if I'm growing and I love my growth and it's working well and I'm I'm meeting my goals, I'm where I want to be, it works for you. Um, but these are the things that regardless on which side of the fence you that you decide to reside when it comes to network, um, this is going to be part of your insurance decisions within an office. One other thing that I want to emphasize is that, again, regardless of your contracting situation, we now have the ability to entrust things in our practices to the experts that have the expertise, okay? Um, it may be indirect bonding. Who do you outsource things clinically to? You know, um, who do you outsource your auto payments to? Hopefully it's OrthoBank. Um, you've got to look for that expertise because it's hard and it's getting harder to have it within our office. And my outsourcing, um, my choice of outsourcing is OrthoFi. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, it's an end-to-end -end solution. First of all, we talked about all the things that happen in terms of assignment of benefit, what it is you need to look for. They do that verification of benefits. They take care of your claims. They take care of your benefit receivables, okay? Um, not just that, the OrthoFi program in itself is more than insurance, okay? So you really have to look at does it make sense now for me to be outsourcing those things? OrthoFi team members have those specialized skills. And I can tell you, I'm on the other end of the other side of that fence in offices, very often trying to teach those skills. It's difficult. OK, the skills, the knowledge, the core competencies, you know, the simple fact that thousands of offices build such a huge database um, of, of carriers and the experience and what it is that they know that, you know, happens within plans. Um, and again, like myself, OrthoFi understands the need for data. So there's a mounting interest and a commitment on OrthoFi to know what's in our best interest with networks and where are we going with networks. And I know because of conversations I've had with OrthoFi, that that's only going to get better. So do I look to be in network? Do I look to be out of network? Is it a better solution for me to entrust someone outside of the office? And if that's the case, you need to talk to OrthoFi. So I know I may have not given a lot of answers as to whether you should or whether you shouldn't be in network. I am hoping that I've certainly given you enough direction and enough information to be able to sit down and put the puzzle pieces together to make a better decision. So thank you, OrthoFi, for giving me the time today. And thank you, everyone who's attended the webinar. And if I if you can reach out to me um, with any questions or anything like that, this is my email, and I am happy to field questions um, outside of the webinar. Um, information, there's no cost for information as far as I'm concerned. So thanks for having me, Marla. Thank you, Tina. Um, that was fantastic, and I'm sure that the practices listening have a lot of food for thought and um, probably, you know, it's almost like you, you present things and then they're there are more questions and more Always. questions and more questions. So um, we do have a few questions from the from the people attending today. So I'm just going to go through some of these and let you answer them for us, okay. Tina. Um, so there's a question here that, that their doctor recently met another doctor who said he's in network with a carrier, however, files the claim with the code D8999 
for the difference between the contracted rate and his fees for treatment. Um, she's asking that she said now the doctor's interested in exploring this. Is this legal? Okay. Um, a D8999 is basically a catch-all code. Okay. So in other words, if there is no code, insurance code to file for something, you file it under a D8999. And offices for years have used that code to file upcharges, okay, to file electives. Um, not every carrier allows that. And you have to be aware if they do. On my verification form, if, if you're doing that, you need to ask, and it's plan specific. You need to ask if you can or if you can't. You know, I am very, very transparent with insurance in my offices. If you're submitting a D8999 because you're in network, that has to be disclosed to a patient because it's an out-of-pocket and a patient has to sign an authorization that are they're agreeing to it. Um, I've had people tell me that a D8999 covers their retainer program, you know, the program that we we now offer patients, you know, for retainers for life or for a period of time. No way. There's no way. First of all, it doesn't have a date of service. OK, what I feel is missing sometimes with offices who feel that that's working for them in every way is they're not catching the codes and the notes on their EOBs that tell them whether they can or whether they can't. But there are certain things that you can, but many, many more that you can't under a D8999. So hopefully that will answer the question. Um, don't take somebody's word for it. Explore, explore your options and be very careful with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a question here. What is the best way to get in network? with a new insurance and how to negotiate the fees with existing? The two questions really. The okay. best way to get in network yeah. and then how to negotiate fees. Um, the best way to get in network again is to seek out someone who does it on a regular basis. It's their expertise, okay? Um, for years, I've had a company that, that I've seen that has had some of the highest rates out there for in-network, um, and they're called Five Lakes Pro, um, as in the Great Lakes, Five Lakes Pro. Um, they negotiate fees. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, if I want to renegotiate the fees that I have within some of my plans, first of all, I'm going to tell you, MetLife doesn't negotiate. It is what it is. If you're a MetLife contractor, you're accepting what it is MetLife offers. Delta Dental typically will not negotiate or, you know, they'll, they'll basically maybe give you something when it comes to every once in a while, they might up their fees a little bit. Um, but so I would say this, other than those plans that perhaps I just mentioned, you have to look at what your ability is to negotiate. And typically when you contract, it's a period of time. Um, many times it's not annual, it might be biannual or not biannual, every two years, I would say. Um, so you have to look, you have to look and you have to inquire, but forget Delta Dental and forget MetLife. It's not gonna happen. Okay, that there is another question. So I think you've just answered this, but um, she says, is there a way to negotiate with Delta Dental in particular to raise their and I'm not sure what this means, MACs? Maximum allowable charges. Okay. Okay, allowable fees. It's a very colorful language with terminology and insurance. <laughs> um, Delta Dental, uh, again, um, it, it depends who you're contracted with. You know, Delta Premier has gone away. Um, and there's, if you're in network with Delta Premier, forget it. You're not going to re, you're not going to, renegotiate any fees with Delta Premier. My experience has been that PPOs may, um, they may work with you, Delta PPOs. Um, I've had success with offices that are not currently contracted with them. Um, but the only way you know is, is to go and inquire. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what would be your advice when you're dealing with an insurance company that you're out of network with and they will not give you their UCR? How do you give the patient an accurate quote? So you're out of network and, and they're not. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the plans that I've experienced in the offices I work with experience that have UCRs, I would say that, um, you know, 
typically, um, you know, you may be looking at Guardian, who probably has a UCR in the range of $3,800 to $4,000 for a full treatment case. And that's kind of what we base it on in our office, in my offices that I work with. Um, uh, a phase one fee um, of maybe not more than $1,200. But the only way you can be sure is to do a pre-estimate, a predetermination. Um, but I usually stick with those kind of numbers. Um, and if it's if it's full treatment, I know that you know they're probably going to base it on thirty eight hundred to four thousand dollars. If it's phase one, I'm not sure. Um, but I usually let a patient know that you know the insurance carrier has some of their own internal dealings in terms of how they. Uh, so, how they, excuse me, determine your benefit. Um, we can't be sure unless we pre preauthorize, um, predetermine. But um, I, I usually try to go with what I know will at least be allowed. Um, you know, a fee twelve hundred to eighteen hundred for phase one, thirty eight to four thousand for full treatment. Okay. Um, there's a question here about certain codes. Um, so, what codes should we be using for IPR? and enamelplasty billing codes. Okay. Well, first of all, I would say this. Um, I, You have to make sure that you're doing those procedures. You're documenting those procedures. Um, you have narratives for those procedures. Your charting indicates you've done those procedures. And um, you've got enamelplasty at either a 9951 or a 9952. Um, read the code descriptions. Um, in terms of like what it entails, um, but those are your enamel plasty, either limited or complete. And 9971 is the IPR um, that you'll find, and that's a per tooth code or a per, sur uh, excuse me, a per interproximal surface. So if you're submitting IPR, it has, you, you, they're going to ask for teeth. Which teeth are you doing them on? Okay. Um, and this is with the same question. Is the best practice to send those separately from the contract? You have to submit those on the date of service. Okay. They have to be submitted on the date of service. I've heard offices tell me that they've broken it out on the initial contract without um, without a date of service. And typically what may or may not come back is like what's allowed and they start that benefit. Um, but it usually kicks in something where, where they don't accept the claim. Um, so uh, lumping it, you're, you're taking a risk. You, you just don't know in, until you work it that way. I would say that um, the, the path is much more difficult than just putting it all together on one claim, um, but it should be explained to the patients. And if you're, if you're submitting line items to your insurance, they should be line items um, within your contract, or at least within the description of what your treatment entails. Okay. Okay. There's a question here. How do you verify benefits and present accurate benefits for phase one? I was told that the phase one code doesn't work anymore after 2022 and that you have to submit it limited and they won't get the maximum benefit. Yes, there used to be three levels of CDT codes. It used to be limited, what they called interceptive and then comprehensive. Um, that mid-level code went away, those codes went away two years ago. And now um, carriers are now identifying that those particular types of treatment as limited. Again, um, in-network providers usually look at an 8070, which clearly states in the descriptor of the CDT that it can be used for phase treatment, um, for multiple phases of treatment. But you have to ask if the plan allows more than one comprehensive code. Um, so again, it, it's not a yes or no answer in any one place. You have to look at what that patient's plan allows. Okay, awesome. Um, I the, well, we just got one more. Is IPR done in conjunction with ortho aligner treatment considered part of comprehensive treatment? Um, I, I think I, um, yes. IPR typically, um, you know, when, when you have your aligner cases and they come back, they typically indicate IPR, you know, in certain areas of the mm -hmm. dentition, you know, for the aligners to work. And that's where I see it. Um, 99% of the time. IPR is typically associated with a liner treatment. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Tina. That's the end of our questions. Um, if you don't mind, stop uh, to stop sharing your presentation. I sure okay. will. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Thanks, Ortha. Bye.
So we'll come back to you in just a second, Tina, for our goodbyes. Um, I do want to uh, tell everyone here, we've got a couple of specials for the for everyone who's in attendance. First of all, I know Tina gave some, some great shout outs to OrthoFi. Thank you so much for that, Tina. Um, if you're not an OrthoFi customer, we do have a couple specials as part of this webinar. If you complete a demo by the end of this month, you'll receive $2,000 off your setup fee when you sign up. And for the first three practices that sign up based on this webinar, there will be a full 50% off the implementation fee. So that's a great deal there. Also want to tell you about Tina Burns Masterclass that's coming up November 10 and 11 of this year. So, you know, we just had an hour together today and I'm sure we could do such a, a deeper dive into, uh, you know, just kind of pick Tina's brain on all that she knows about insurance. And so we would love to have you join us at um, our meeting in Scottsdale later this fall. And if you want to use this QR code right here, because you're here today as a, as a webinar attendee, you'll get $40 off and you can register using the, the term, the, the discount code insights, um, insights there. So this will be valid through September 22nd. And again, this is just, we've done several of these master classes. They're fabulous. Um, Tina just really you know talks through all all aspects of insurance in an orthodontic practice. So we'd love to have you join us for that. And then finally, um, I did mention our next this year, uh, business meeting that we have once a year. I mentioned that earlier, and that is coming up February 1 through 3. That is not just for OrthoFi clients. It's, it's for everyone in the industry who is really just looking to learn and grow. So if you use this uh, QR code that's on the screen, you'll get an additional 5% off. And right now, I, I believe we're still in early bird pricing. So this, you know, this will be the best pricing you can get. Additional 5% off the early bird pricing, which depending on your ticket could save you another 25 to $40. So um, Tina, thank you again for being here with us. And Absolutely, my pleasure. It was, it was fabulous as always. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, we look forward to you joining us on another expert in, in <laughs> we, we look forward to you joining us in another webinar very soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.